Hello, can you hear me? Can the audience hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Can't hear myself. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two, one, two. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. One, two, my voice. My voice is still being tested. Does this mic need to be anywhere else? It accidentally clipped off. Give me a second. One, two, one, two. Test, test, test. Testing, one, two. One, two, one, two. Test, test, test. We are here, we are ready. Can you hear me enough? Is this good enough? Okay. Let's start this thing. So, what you might see from the presentation title is kind of cryptic lessons learned from a year of Unreal Engine AAA development. It used to be called Unreal Engine 4 AAA development, but it applies also to 5, so I uh, removed the number. There's a big Housemark logo there. It's because I used to work at Housemark when I made this. So I'm not going to try to take the title, as this is now something that Epic owns. And uh, you can actually see this. If you, if you kind of like don't hear me say something, or you wish you could pause me, you can. This presentation is on my website, ada.games. And there's some of these slides are old and uh, out of date, and I will try to maybe kind of correct them as I go. Like, uh, for example, this first slide is a really <laughs> old image of me, but I love it because it's so unflattering. I think we should all embrace our kind of flaws is what makes us special. So back when I, there's a bit of feedback that I'm hearing, guys. So back when I originally made this, these slides, I was lead programmer at Housemark. I had 12 years of game industry then, only doing actually social and mobile games uh, using Flash and uh, Unity. And I had only been using Unreal Engine 4 for one year. But I did put one slide into it, and it was my updated slide. But you already saw this during the keynote, so I'm not going to go much um, over that. But I want to start with, every time it says our, I'm talking about Housemark. It's not me. So, um, but yeah, Housemark's journey to Unreal Engine 4. So Housemark is the oldest game company in Finland, and as such, they've made quite many games. But all the games before Matterfall had in common is that they were all used using made using custom engines. And um, actually, we, pro we know what happened in 2019. We started working on Returnal. Um, but always making our own custom engines had its um, problems. So for every game, we needed to rewrite some part of the engine. Yeah. We were also reinventing many wheels that had already been sold by other solutions. And we needed our smartest coders constantly on the engine, which meant that they couldn't be working on the gameplay itself. For every new platform, we needed support, uh, and we needed to make extra work for that. And our content team also had lackluster tools to work with, especially in the beginning. And we couldn't ramp up production with content until the engine was up to speed, which meant it might take us a year or even more before we could even start working on the actual game itself. Which brings us to Metafall, our first game using Unreal Engine 4. So our team didn't have many programmers, but the ones that did could work directly on the game. And the designers could start prototyping immediately using Unreal's tools. Another pro is that when hiring, new developers could already be pre-onboarded, just if they knew Unreal Engine already. Our last arcade game, Nex Machina, got a great score and many awards, but it did not sell well. Making arcade games just wasn't working out for us anymore. It just wasn't paying the bills. So it prompted our CEO to publish this article, Arcade is Dead. Um, some of you know that after we re, uh, released Returnal, Arcade isn't dead. It's, we just reinvented it. Uh, but back then, just the pure arcade games, it just wasn't working. It was clear we needed to pivot, so we moved on. So we decided to go bigger and better. We started making two projects. There was a smaller team working on Storm Divers, an online battle royale shooter, and then also our first AAA game. This is just, this is Returnal, not unannounced. So for that, we scaled up quite a bit, personnel-wise, and I was the lead programmer on that. Um, and since we were scaling up, we had to pick our battles. 
We don't have the time and resources to make an engine that doesn't contribute directly to making a game, and we need a lot of content. We need the whole team to be able to start working from the start. Uh, that means we don't have the luxury of spending a year or more on just getting the tech up to speed before development can start. And we need to find our focus. Are we making a game or are we making an engine? And this is actually a good example I like to say, tell about. Like Netflix, they decided to offload all of their cloud development to Amazon's AWS servers because they wanted to specialize in making Netflix, the experience and the content. They already, there already was someone who was specialized in cloud and they did it better and cheaper. So Housemark decided to have Epic specialize in making the engine, which they had done for over 20 years. And now Housemark is using Unreal on all of their projects. And uh, I keep switching between they and we. So, but yeah, we learned a lot of lessons working with Unreal, which brings me to the first big lesson. One third of this talk is dedicated to this one big lesson, so, uh, because that's just how important it is. Every time I see um, a team working on Un Unreal and I'm saying, like, oh, let me like, see what you're doing. Maybe I can like, review your project a little bit. They always have the same problem. Every, every, every studio, even AAA studios, especially AAA studios, because there it affects the team the most. But that is references. So like, how many of you are already like, oh yeah, like put up your hand if you kind of know, like I think I know where this is going. Come on, let me see some hands. Like, you, yeah, 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 okay. For the rest of you who didn't raise your hands, you are in for a treat, cause yeah, okay. So this is the first hard lesson teams working with Unreal will learn when scaling up. And the earlier in the project that you start doing this properly, the better, because it can be very tedious cleaning up older projects. Let's start with an example. So let's say that when I press spacebar, I want to spawn a player character. So we make a small blueprint that does just that. Um, and I mean, this is how most game prototypes start. You can see there, we put like on space, ooh, and it's a pointer. And then um, here's the actor, BB character, and that's it. So great, super easy. And the character spawned exactly when I press space. Hmm. Exactly when I pressed space, no? That's fast. Looking at the time I pressed space and when the characters begin play was called, just traced it out, we can see it happens at the same millisecond, the same frame. So the thing is, Unreal does a lot of things for you. So this thing there, that is um, where we put the character class into the spawn node. That's a reference. And references make blueprints and their messes, materials, textures, and so on, always ready in memory. And um, if you have a streaming texture, it will always keep the lowest MIP in memory, but otherwise it will stream in the rest. And those can also reference other blueprints, which are also always ready in memory. So you might ask, just when do all of these things that you reference load? With a map, by default. It loads everything referenced, assets, their assets, their assets, assets, etc. The good thing is, everything is always loaded and ready to spawn. The bad thing is that everything is always loaded, even if you're not planning on spawning it. So actually, well, for many assets, this is how we actually want it to work. Um, like, for example, for your own player character, you usually want it to be ready already when you load the map, if it's the first thing you see. But Let's look at one example where this might be bad for us. So let's say we have a weapon chest that can spawn any of these weapons when you open it. So we need to know what weapons there are for us to spawn. So let's create a ver variable and let's call, call it all weapons, which is an array of class references. And we'll put all the weapon, weapon blueprints into that array. So now, um, when we open the chest, we just pick a random weapon, one from here, and we just spawn it. Now let's say that we have an empty map with nothing but this one chest in it, nothing else. So if you want to see all the references that the map has, you can right click it and open it in the reference viewer. This is a really, really useful tool and I recommend you get familiar with it. And it will show it like this. I've increased up there 
The search does limit to two, so we'll see a bit more, uh, two levels of references. So each white line is a heart reference or a direct dependency. And uh, you can see that only by having this one weapon test in the level, only this, we're also getting all of that crap. Everything referenced. And yeah, okay, references, 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 like lots of references. What, what does it mean in practice? So for that, I'm gonna open another window, and this time let's check out the size map. Okay, that's a lot of information, a lot of stuff, it's a lot of everything. So I'll explain what you're seeing. This shows us what each asset loads and how big it is. So on the top, on the top there, we can see um, the map, test map. And that contains the weapons test. So it will load that. And then the squares inside of it are like what it will load. So then the weapons test also contains all the weapons, which each contains their own assets like models and textures. And a big chunk of those 75 megabytes get loaded when you load the map, which is low, like uh, not included in te textures, of course, which get streamed in. And they all stay in memory, which is limiting. So before you can avoid making a dependency, it helps knowing what actually makes a dependency. So having a ver variable, which is an object or class reference, it will load any object which you put in there, and then also the type of the variable itself, even though it's empty. Like in this image where we made a reference to any weapon that extends weapon base. So no matter if the variable, variable is empty, it will always reference and load at least weapon base also. And this also applies to function parameters and local variables and everything like that. Also, just by using the cast node, that's also making a hard reference to that class. So let's say we have a player character checking which object it touches, so it can play a sound or something like that. Um, so if you just do a cast just to check the type, then you're referencing that class object and it gets loaded with that blueprint. So here, um, weapon base might already have some asset references, meaning those will get loaded just with this check. So let's fix it, and the sooner you start fixing these, the better. Um, so for loading objects, you can use soft references and only load the objects asynchronously when you actually need them. To do that, we can change the type of all weapons to use soft class references, and then we get this pink color instead. So now when you, then to actually load the asset, then we're using the async load node, which only continues when it's done loading, or right away if it's already loaded. So just be careful when you're using the asset from the complete pin uh, that you use that and not the default pin because the default pin will continue immediately, even like whether it's loaded or not. So it's good to have like a test opening animation or some particles to hide that it's actually loading. Now if you check the weapon references, they've all turned purple. And that means that they're a soft reference and they won't get loaded unless you're explicitly loading them yourself except the weapon base blueprint for some reason. And if we check the level size map, we can see that, yeah, all the guns are gone, well, except for the weapon base blueprint. So there's a reason for that. When we make a class reference, reference variable, we usually want to make it of some base class type, like a weapon base. So we can be sure that we'll only get weapons that are children of that blueprint. It's a good practice but a soft reference of some base type makes that base, ta base type a hard dependency. It means that we need to load it. It's stupid, I should probably make a ticket on it since now I can. <laughs> so, but there's a few ways to get around that. One easy way is to simply make the base blueprint very lightweight with no references to other assets, so it's like, oh, whatever. Um, one bad thing about that is you can never be fully sure that it won't get dependencies later on, especially on big projects with lots of developers. Another one is that sometimes you do want these base blueprints to have some assets in it, which is like perfectly valid and often a good practice. So a better way would be to use a native C++ class reference instead. So you could just use actor as the base type, but then we lose the ability to filter the weapon to blueprint, to weapon blueprints only, which is of course why we want to have a variable type in the first place. So to solve that, we can make our own class and um, you don't have to be a programmer to do that, like anyone can do this. Um, you maybe consult with a programmer before, so you're not just creating classes, and they're like, the book is this. So you just click the Add New button, and you select the new C++ class, 
and then have the actor be the base class, and then we'll name it weapon base. And then in the weapon base blueprint in its class settings, then we reparent it, uh, reparent it to our new weapon base C++ class. And finally, we change the chest's weapons array to be of the C++ class type instead of the blueprint type. Now, if we check the level size map, we're only loading in three megs. That's down from 75 megabytes previously. Faster game load and less memory hopped. Awesome. So that's mostly it for loading assets, but then we, al we also have already loaded an instanced objects. And instead of using cast or variables of a certain type, you can also use blueprint interfaces. As an example, let's say we want to be able to speak to some actors. We have NPCs and they can speak to us, so we have to have a speak function. But the gameplay designer decided that one of the weapon chests should also be able to talk. Ah, those designers. Well, okay, well, that chest isn't an NPC, so it can't share the same base class. So we add another cast. And then one of the level props, a tree, that should be able to speak also. And so on and so forth. So this is a great example, actually, of when interfaces can really save the day. They allow us to call the same named function on very different actors. So to do that, let's just, I'll just show you an example. So we'll just add a new blueprint interface to our project and let's call it BPI for blueprint interface, speaker. And then we'll create a single function in it called speak. So now we can go to the class settings of the blueprints we want to speak and we just add the interface there. Then we'll implement the function by right clicking and select event speak in the add event category. And um, back in our character blueprint, which we were calling the speak function from, we just get the actor and we just call speak on it. The best thing about interfaces in Unreal is that they don't work just like they do in code, is that you can call a speak interface function on every object, even though it doesn't implement that interface. And that function will only be called if two conditions are met. The actor implements the interface and the actor has the function. Because the actor can implement the interface without even implementing the function. So it's very like um, kind of generic how you can use it. You can just call interface function, speak on every single actor in the level. Well, don't do that, but still you could. And uh, only the ones that actually implement the interface and have the speak function will get called there. I hope after all of this, you ha I haven't made you scared of using any kind of references because you know references, they are your friends. Don't try to get around them by having like plain string references or something. That's horrible, it gives me nightmares. There's a few reasons for that. Um, did I, yeah, okay. So Unreal uses the references to know which assets should, it should packets when you build your project. So unless your asset is a primary asset, like maps are by default, it will not get packaged. <coughs> unless it is referenced or in an always cook directory. But I, I prefer not to use always cook directories at all. Rather just make it primary assets. Also it keeps the size map honest. And that was the one where I right click and saw how big it is. The size map uses the asset registry to see what references what and you'll need a correct size map to help debug what's loading and when. Also Unreal checks if anything is referencing assets that you're trying to delete. So if nothing uses the assets, it's fine to delete them. And when you move an asset, if anything references the asset, then Unreal will create a redirector for you. If you don't have any references, it will not even bother with the redirector. Okay, this is actually, this is an old slide, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. So this is uh, the easiest place to forget to use reference is when you're using a level loading function, because back in the day in Unreal Engine 4, for some reason, this was the only way to load a level. You had to use a string there. And there's three bad things about this. First is that we lose out on all the benefits that I just said that references have. And secondly, it opens you up for mistakes. For example, if you mistype a level name, there's like no checks for that. And third, now you're able to use only the short level name, like there, my level, instead of using the full path name. And the bad thing about doing that is that, like, Unreal doesn't have a list of all your maps. It has a list of all your assets. So when you say load my level, it's like, okay, I don't know what the full path is, so let me just quickly scan through every single asset in your asset registry for your entire game and see if I find it, which is very, very slow. 
uh, the more your project grows. And you won't notice it at the beginning, but then your project grows, and then suddenly, why is this hit happening when we're loading the level? It must be when it's loading. No, it's just finding the level to load. But I just added this slide. So now there's an open level by object reference, and it takes in a soft object reference, so it doesn't load it like uh, immediately, and then you can put in, uh, this is LX bands from Lyra. So always use this one, never use the one that takes in a string, um, unless you want to load a level, like for example, by a primary asset ID, but then get the ID and use the full path, never use the short path. I told you references were important. Like now, now I'm done with the references. So now let's move on to lessons learned on practical development. Ticks, they just don't scale well. So having too many things ticking each frame can hit your frame rate hard. You need to ask yourself, does this code I'm writing really need to run 60 times per second? Often it doesn't. Consider ticking less off, often by increasing the tick interval or even turning off ticking when the object is either far away or not even visible. Having said that, I also want to add now a little bit. Um, profile, see if it's a problem first. It's fine to use tick functions. Some people will say you should use it like events instead. Well, if you're doing it every single frame, it's the same problem. The problem is you're just doing too much. So actually, the lesson should be do less. Fail faster, oh, I, this is still like my number one. Like, um, so you need to fail faster because when you fail faster, you can fix faster. So get a continuous integration server set up and compile a game every time someone commits something. You don't even need to cook the content during these builds. You, they, they, they need to be fast, so um, you can keep them as non-unity builds to catch missing header includes, which can sometimes be forgotten, but still work locally on unity builds. And when I say unity builds, that is when it combines multiple C++ files into one big one. You're not actually making, you're not using the unity engine, just making sure you, we're all on the same page here. Also compile the blueprints. Uh, Unruh will not do that automatically for you if you're only compiling the code. So you can actually run a commandlet that just is called run compile all blueprints. It will compile all blueprints except level blueprints. Take that into uh, consideration. And this will help you find blueprint errors. So we did that in Housemark and we had a continuous integration. So every time someone committed, it would compile the code, run compile all blueprints, and as soon as there were a single error, we would uh, break the build and we would send the notification on Slack and it would be like, bing, 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 ah, they broke the build, and then it's like, oh no, shame. <laughs> but it's not about being shamed, it's about just seeing, oh shit, it's broken, let's fix it as, soon as, as, as quickly as we can. Um, but you should also not only fail faster, you should also fail better. So I actually recommend against doing too defensive programming, like adding an is valid and null checks everywhere. Because if you expect that some variable shouldn't be a null pointer, then getting a null pointer usually means that something is wrong. So if you just allow it, then you're adding undefined behavior. How will your game run if your function like really needed some reference but didn't get it and you just decided, oh, let's just not do anything instead? So just have a crash. If you have a crash instead, you'll get a stack trace and you'll be able to actually fix it instead of getting super obscure bugs that can take forever to find the cost for. And uh, in C++, you can use the check function for that. So it won't crash in production builds, just in case you didn't catch it. But since sometimes you don't want it to crash, but still get like a breakpoint and a warning message if it happens when, for example, connected to Visual Studio, like within the editor. And in those cases, sure, add the null check, but wrap it in an ensure also. So that if a programmer is running it from Visual Studio, they'll still catch it. Or if someone has the um, output panel open, they'll get the error there. Oh wow, this is, this is something new I added here, and um, I'm gonna do this. I've never done this before. It's a song, apparently. I put a song in there. <laughs> this is so, this is so stupid. <laughs> okay, 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 I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> if you're getting undefined behavior, and you're looking for a savior, then instead of using is valid, let it crash, let it crash, let it crash. <laughs> I put this in there like way after I was done with this presentation. I was like, I'll never do this again probably. <laughs> so yeah, let it crash. <laughs> um, like one of the best 
examples of this is like, for example, you have um, input component. Uh, no, you, you're tying to input component in an actor, and you know, first check, do I have input co component? And it's like, you kind of need that. And uh, if you don't have it, something is seriously wrong. Um, so I would just, I wouldn't even like add a check or anything. I would just start using it immediately. Um, and also, I've seen some people add a check after using new object. Like, here's a new object. Let's check if we got it. It's like, what? It's like, oh, let's see if computer works. Like, it's like you would usually get something from new object unless the computer's on fire. So, like, if you can already, like, fail gracefully from your computer being on fire, like, all the power to you, but usually games don't, then it'd be nice to just have a crash. Then uh, you get sent the crash report, and then you can see it, and like, what is this? Ah! Instead of it being hidden somewhere and just having a motionless character in your game, and that's not going to get reported unless you get, like, a user report or something, but then you don't know the stack. But anyway, anyways, um, also get to know your profiling tools. So I'm still, <laughs> this song is great. So uh, Unreal Engine has built in CPU and also uh, GPU profilers you should know how to use. Unreal Insights is great with, uh, I just told you about Unreal Insights in Unreal Engine 5, it has the memory profiler also. Um, and RenderDoc also, it's free and plugs very easily into Unreal, good for profiling what happened during a frame and how long it took. Uh, but remember also that Profile GPU does already most of this. And uh, the built-in profiler is quite good, but it's using telemetry, meaning it only measures functions that have been marked to measure themselves. So I also recommend getting acquainted with sampling profilers. This is mostly for the people handling profiling in general, meaning um, like tech art, programmers, that kind of stuff. But of course, if you like the built-in profiler, the Unreal Insights, I think any anyone should be able to use that. Uh, but the sampling profilers and of those, that's, yeah, that's fine to like have the specialized people. Um, I really like very lazy. It's simple, it's free. If someone says, my game is frozen, I usually tell them, download very lazy, start a profile capture and press stop and just send me the file. And they can usually do it while it's still frozen. Um, it's very good for seeing what's happening um, on a single thread. And you can capture all threads and then you just have to remember to click the uh, bin main to see what the main thread is doing. And also, uh, Housemark was using Superluminal, still is, which is fantastic, fantastic in multi-threaded profiling. And it even shows you when a threat is blocked, what other threat it's waiting on. It's really nice. It's probably my favorite uh, sampling, to, uh, sampling profiler there is. Uh, but importantly, just use the target platform profiling tools. So if you're developing for iOS, use Xcode, consoles, uh, PIX, and Razer, and even specific PC, CPUs, and graphics cards using the, have their own profiler. So modules, get used to, this is for the programmers, try to get used to writing your code in modules. It makes compilation a bit faster by improving linking time, but one of the best reasons to use it is to encourage loose coupling, which makes your code reusable by default, which is great if you plan on making more games. Uh, I actually have a really, really, really great presentation on modules on my website, added.games, and uh, when I joined Epic Games, we actually used the content from that presentation to fill our documentation but the uh, video has even more info, and it's still up to date, so do that. Uh, for distributing the build, you know, when everyone on the team needs to be able to have it to play test and stuff like that. Um, at Housemark, we used the past tense, Resilio, which uses Torrent technology to de deliver the build to everyone else. So whenever a new build is available, everyone in the office will get the latest version automatically. Very low barrier to get people to play the build. But having said that now, after having shipped the returnal, this very quickly saturated our network link because every time it was a new build and it kept growing in size, it was a few tens of gigabytes, um, and then shipping it to every single developer in the office, and it did not scale well also um, when people started doing remote. Uh, we actually stopped using Resilio once we were pa pa past a certain size, and we went back to just hand delivering it by either downloading it from NAS or having the continuous integration server push it manually to the dev kits in the server rooms. But the thing is, like, Resilio is still probably good, for example, if you only want to ship it to, for example, all the meeting rooms. So whenever you can just jump in and try a dev kit there. So um, I still recommend it for certain sizes. Don't go overboard like we did. Check it out. And now to iteration time, because wasted time is wasted money. Short iteration time leads to better game. Long iteration. To, uh, leads to worse game and also can frustrate developers. 
if it takes half an hour to open Unreal Engine, like just how many man hours are you missing? So many teams get hit by this one, we did. And you, for example, here, so this is an Unreal Engine 4. This is another thing that now we're updating live. It's Unreal Engine 5, we actually fixed that. So you don't have a loading that just is stuck doing nothing. I don't know what's happening. Now we actually show you exactly what's happening. It took us till Unreal Engine 5 to do it. We all, apparently, we always had it. We were just showing the wrong end of the stack. <laughs> Anywho, um, while we were making Returnal, it used to take more than two minutes for us every single time we wanted to launch the editor. And I was just wondering what it's doing. And it's so funny reading this now because two minutes and we were complaining about it. And then I'm hearing about all these like bigger studios. Like uh, if you're allowed to tell, like how long does it take to open the editor into your level? Just shout it out if you're allowed. No? 20 minutes. <gasps> so I didn't know other studios had this problem. So I was like, it has to take more than two minutes. And people are like, you mother. <laughs> so like, what is it doing? Well. It's loading the startup map. And then when it's loading the startup map, uh, oftentimes there's also like a compiling the series. But like even with a hot uh, derived data cache, like it would still take minutes and like yeah, up to 20 minutes for some studios. So um, this is another reason why you should keep direct references in check because the editor also needs to load these assets and they're fatter on the editor. Also, ask yourself, do I really need to start the editor in the startup map that might maybe take you straight into the main map where everything is happening? Because for us, most developers start the editor to work on an asset or a specific submap. So like we almost never work on the actual starting map. So we just we wanted to play when we hit the play button, otherwise we'd be fine with loading into nothing. So there's my pro tip, load into nothing. Have a proxy map as the editor startup map only for editor development, uh, just, you just create an empty level through the new asset dialog to keep it truly empty, and then in the level blueprint, load the actual starting level and begin play. Oh. So, uh, and yeah, you sure, this is, I made a custom note that actually takes in the reference. This was before Unreal had it, so I made my own. Uh, oh, yeah, actually, I, just before I got here, I hit a lot of slides that was about how to create that note, but I hit it now because it's already built in. Just by doing this simple little thing, Housemark, we had a Housemark managed to cut the editor opening time from over two minutes down to 30 seconds. And uh, people are opening the editor all the time, so I imagine all the man hours saved. And oh, here's actually, I have in my speaker notes, I've heard of big companies where opening the editor takes half an hour or more. It hits maybe too close, sorry. So, Lastly, if you do want to op in open into a specific map without editing the project settings, you can have the editor ignore it and just open the last map you worked on. So just change this setting in the editor preferences, load level at startup, and just put it to last opened. And this is uh, per, this is not project wide, this is like just for your own. So um, again, for the coders, Visual Assist, it's a plugin for Visual Studio, it is faster and better than a built in IntelliSense. Actually, this is quite old. Uh, I'm using now Visual Studio 2022, and it's gotten usable. I don't even use um, Visual Assist X anymore with 2022. And also, uh, do I have on another slide? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you about it now. The writer is also quite nice. Also, um, Visual Assist and Writer autocomplete U macros. That's something that Visual Studio does not do. You also get instant file and simple search. That means any function, class, variable, macro, anything in your game and the whole engine it will, like, you just start typing it, and it will filter the list instantly, like every keystroke. And it has great navigational features and other quality of life improvements, like GoTo and stuff like that. Um, I actually do like the joke that starting to develop with Unreal Engine isn't free. It costs you a license of Visual Assistant or Writer. Because um, back when I made the slides, I didn't want to develop without it. One of the biggest load downs to iteration time is code compiling, so we should do everything we can to cut that down. This is uh, XKCD that I see used very often by programmers. So to do that, I have my RS three tiers for compilation. Um, start with the fasting, fastest. Number one is Live++. It usually only takes a few seconds, and depending on your code structure, sometimes even less than a second. And it is uh, included for free with Unreal Engine 4.22 onwards, so there's no reason for you not to use it, especially not 
because this doesn't apply anymore. We fixed it. For Unreal Engine 5, you can uh, edit header files just fine. You can change your macros. You can just go wild, and it will just work. Um, that's, that's a lie. It works. What else do I have? Well, OK, you don't need to. Actually, Hot Reload, we don't even have that anymore. We uh, deprecated it. So ignore, ignore, ignore. <laughs> and Visual Studio Compile, and that's the last thing. Like, well, if nothing works, you just close the editor and you recompile again from Visual Studio. And that's the slowest method of them all. It's not, like, it's not super slow, but it is the slowest because you need to start the editor again, which is why it should be your last option. And then, you know, compiling C++ code is very slow, but it uses multiple cores very well, so we need to take advantage of that. One option, just throw more hardware at the problem. Good for studios with a lot of money. So you can give each programmer a very beefy multi-core CPU, like a Threat Ripper or something. It can turn out to be quite expensive. And you won't, do you also want to do it then for everyone working with shaders? Give them Threat Rippers. That adds even more to the cost. So a, a cheaper option um, is to just distribute it. So this is what we did at Housemark. This is what we currently do even at Epic Games, is that we just use Incredibuild for all coders and either, even shader developers. Best thing about that, it scales really, really well, scales maybe better, and better than more people we have on the project. So I was compiling Unreal Engine recently uh, at the office, and it was using like I think it's at 150 cores. And it's like I don't know if you can, I don't know if there's a threat ripper like that, but with Incredibility you can have that. It's also uh, very efficient as it only uses idle cores on other people's machines, so I'm not slowing them down, and uh, often. Like what we did eventually at Housemark is that we had dedicated Threat Ripper helper machines. And that's also what we do at Epic Games. So we just have Threat Rippers only for helping uh, with code building. It's not uh, free. Wait. Mm, yeah, and you can always add. Yeah, OK. Well, now I was just skipping ahead of myself, and then I had it here anyways. So you can still, uh, no, OK, yeah, it's, it's not free. It still costs money, but it pays for itself multiple times with all the time saved. And I've heard that uh, there are free alternatives that do work, like fast build. But I also have heard that um, some people have been having problems with it. It's not tightly integrated because we're using Incredible, and we're just making sure that works. Like, um, I don't know. But yeah, using Incredible that housemark means that we can do a complete rebuild of the whole engine, game code, and plugins in 10 minutes. And that was like, yeah, just the housemark. Like, at Epic, it's even faster. But the thing is, you shouldn't even need a, to do a full rebuild that often anyways, unless you're working like, in the engine, on the engine headers, which like, we at Epic are actually doing quite a bit. So derived data cache. So it's usually a local folder on your computer when Unreal stores the generated versions of your assets. Usually, everyone generates their own. Um, but an asset always gets generated the same way by everyone, so you could all just use the same folder by setting up a shared folder on your local network and just um, make search fast. Oh, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself. So now as soon as, as the file has been generated, like the shader or something has been generated by one developer, it can just be directly downloaded by others. And um, you can also populate it from a build machine at night to make sure everything is ready when people come in the morning, specifically if you're doing some other automatic generation nightly anyways. And uh, I know that our whole build thing, the, using the DC and stuff, dry data cache, yeah, um, it is the slowest part of using Unreal. It's like, oh, I need to build. Well, there, there goes an hour of my life. And we are working on it. We are creating a new architecture called Zen and a build system called Horde, which means that instead of having derived data cache, we go one step further and have fully built assets in a store. And you can have that store by, like, by default on your own computer. So then if you're using a dev kit, it will just download directly from Zen instead of like, so you can basically have Cuckoo the Fly. But it's the same assets that you used on your own computer. And even the whole studio can use it. And we're building it even so it's remote work friendly, so we can even have it in the cloud. But it's not here yet. We're working on it. On to version control. OK, let me wait. I know, like, Zoom is probably using something like Perforce or like some enterprise thing, but um, this presentation was originally made for like uh, user groups and meetups and stuff, so lots of indies. And I actually did talk to one today who was using Git. Anyways, um, I have a bit of a rant on it. <laughs> to start with, I love Git. It is distributed. Uh, everyone has complete local history of the project. It's cheap and powerful branching, and uh, it's free. 
it's really, really, really good for some projects. But for big Unreal projects, well, hmm, let's look at a distributed workflow. It's glorious. Look at this. There's no central server that everyone depends on. It's, there's no single source of truth because everyone who has the repository is just as much a server as anyone else. And uh, people can pull from who they want. Development can be offline for periods of time. And Linus over there, completely made up name, <laughs> he, he can quality control what goes into his branch, which people trust above other branches. Git even got made using with this workflow. But this is not how we're doing version control in game development, is it? In game development, we have a single server which everyone pushes to and pulls from. And what happens if that single server goes down? Well, now none of the developers can pull the latest and the panic starts. And of course, we can't forget about poor old Jenkins. With the central server down, we can't even make new builds. And now the publisher wants to see the newest progress, but the team is a little busy at the moment. So um, I guess we're not really using the distributed part. So I'm going to strike it out. And about that local history, well, the thing about Unreal Assets is that they're just big, fat binary blobs. And we can't have everyone keeping every single revision of every single binary blob fat asset on their drives. We don't have the funding for that many hard drives. And uh, yeah, we don't want the first download of the whole repository to just take days. It's not practical. Which means that the local history is not only not helping us, it's also making things worse. So to make it usable, we can plug in Git's large file storage. Now we only need to download, oh, oh. <laughs> now we only need to download the current version of the binary assets. Great. But now you're truly central. Like there's no other way to get previous versions of those files except from that one single server. Okay, but now the complete local history, well, it's, uh, it's useless, but not in our way. But we made our distributed part even worse, so I'm just gonna add another strike to that. So now to those cheap branches. They're great if you're a programmer only checking in code, but a AAA project has a huge content team working on those Unreal binary assets, and those cannot have merge conflicts, because then we're throwing away work, and I would take God knows how long, so if you branch content, you get in trouble. So like cheap branching is not really like a selling point for us. There is branching, uh, but it's like, it's, it's not cheap even to do it. Like, Normally, so yeah. And if you want exclusive checkouts, you need file locking with LFS supports, and now you're basically using Git as SVN. But hey, uh, at least it's free. Ah, accept. And now, <clears throat> now we start proper rant. <laughs> when a bigger team starts working on Git with its default workflow, your graph starts looking a little bit like this, which makes it impossible to follow, and your history is basically meaningless, because a third of your commits are merge commits, merging the main branch back into itself, which makes what you committed down in an ocean of changes you merge brought from everyone else in the team. And your lead starts screaming about these foxtrot merges, ruining everything, so a team gets a rebase-only policy with a custom pre of hook on the server, which is plain denying your comment if you didn't do it properly, with the master as the first parent branch, which confuses everyone who isn't a senior coder, because now everything is upside down as you get a merge conflict, and theirs is ours, and ours is theirs, and since now you're rewriting history if there never was a merge in the first place, so you lose history on how the merge was sold in the first place, and God help you if you screwed up, and now you have to go back in time with a ref log, which only some select smart people on your team can do right, and all of this takes a lot of time and effort, which is not only teaching everyone this convoluted process, but solving the mess it can create, and time isn't free! <laughs> <clears throat> that, was, that was the rant. So people are using a difficult to work with source control for none of its benefits. So you're just using a hammer to screw in a light bulb. So I, I have to say, I still love Git, but I don't love Git with Unreal Engine game development, and I recommend against it. So at Housemark, before I joined, they were using a mixture of Git for code and SVN for assets to get around these problems which 
had its own problems, so uh, they moved away from it. Um, we did consider the industry standard, Perforce, but uh, it's very expensive, and we're already, already on tight budget, and that's when we found Plastic SEM. And Plastic had a very accessible price, still not free though. If you need something free, then SVN also a good choice, yes. Really, for Unreal, SVN is better than Git in my opinion. There's two different clients for different workflows, the normal one for coders and power users, and Gluon, a simpler client, which also allows you to check out specific assets and commit them without having the whole workspace up to date. It handles sub repositories like a pro. Um, some of our developers didn't even know that we had our repository in different sub repos. And uh, you can branch and merge, and it will be all handled behind the scenes. And my favorite feature, which has amazing merge support, when you click a merge commit, it will show you what changes came in from what merge, and uh, separately which changes, uh, which changes happened that didn't. So for example, you can make uh, one merge commit that merges in two different branches, and then when you want to see more about what happened during that merge, it will tell you all of these changes came from this merge, all of those changes came from that merge, and here, separately, is how you solve the conflict. <laughs> okay, uh, well, it's not perfect. Uh, their code review tools are just not good, and you can't really uh, easily get it working with other code review tools, like my favorite is Crucible and FishEye, which I will, I will die on this hill. It's amazing, you should use it, everyone. Um, but because we couldn't connect to it, it was just like, this is one of the major reasons why we had to go back. Also, um, when Housemark, when we were doing this, um, this is basically, I'm ending now, this is ending slide. But um, after using plastic, one year into the project, I was wearing by it. At the end of the project, um, it's, it was still an early tool in development, and it had some growing problems, and uh, we lost a lot of hours um, having problems with scaling. So actually, for the next project, all of us at Housemark were basically like, we're not using plastic again, we're going with Perforce. Which is funny because I was talking to another company who was like, we are done with Perforce, we're moving to plastic. And I, I made an intro for them where they could like tell each other the problems they've been having. And after that, they were both like, yeah, we're still switching, both. <laughs> so I can't tell you which one is better because apparently the grass is always greener. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, I have a lot of gray hairs. This is what game development does for you. Um, if you have the means and manpower to make an engine, great, fantastic, good for you. Otherwise, I recommend you pick your specialization. Unreal references are powerful, but with great power comes great loading times and memory hogging. Use them correctly. Take less. There's no shame in it. Fail faster and better. Get to know your profiling tools. Use modules when you can. Your code will be better for it. Figure out an easy way to get builds to your team. Iteration time is paramount. Reduce it where you can. Do yourself a favor and get yourself a copy of Visual Assist or Writer, or just upgrade to Visual Studio for 2022 to at least be a little bit usable. Use my three tiers of compilation and get rules, but not with Unreal Engine 4. Consider more game-differently tools like Plastic, Perforce, or even SVN, which is yes, free. And, uh, oh, the Housemark careers is still there. <laughs> Housemark is hiring a guest. <laughs> Thank you. I went a little bit over my time, sorry, but it was the last one, so whatever. Uh, I guess we're still mingling.